Gazetta Football Italia. Q titles. Well, um, I haven't had too good of a week this week. Uh, we got beat again the second game in a row. We've got beat against Foggia. But this week, uh, it's my first derby against Roma, and I'm really looking forward to it. It'll be uh, at 90,000 there, and hopefully this week I can get a goal. Coming up, the 117th Turin Derby, a full house and a thrilling finale. James Richardson with all the news from behind the week's headlines. one of your Serie A heroes. Gaza takes him through another event and he looks ahead to his first road car. Goal action from the top of the table Serie A B. We take time out with Roberto Baggio. He previews tomorrow's explosion by the back. Juventus against AC Milan. And there is a sneak preview of the new Football Italia video. Well, Milan have been doing very well lately, as we all know, unbeaten for so many games. But um, creeping up behind them has been Juventus. And yeah, we'll show you the highlights of Juventus versus Torino. While the Milan derby may be the major football <coughs> fixture in Italy at the weekend, try telling that to the supporters of Torino and Juventus, who have a local dispute of their own to settle. Both teams are starved of the services of star players for this Turin derby game. Torino without their waspish centre-forward Carlos Aguilera, but his tall, muscular striking partner, the appropriately named Walter Casagrande, is on hand to terrorise the Juventus defence. He scored twice in this fixture last season. There's no David Platt or Roberto Baggio in this Juventus team. They both picked up injuries in their respective countries' midweek international games. So the goal-scoring responsibilities will fall on the shoulders of Gianluca Vialli, who cost the club £12 million after a summer transfer from Sampdoria. The Juventus get the match underway, playing from... Dino Baggio fires it forward. Cruzzi will leave it to this goalkeeper. It wasn't a well-directed clearance. Casiraghi! Well, the goalkeeper just about got his geography right, Marco Gianni. But that all stemmed from Marco Gianni's original mistake, handing the ball back to Casiraghi when he was out of position. Good leap by Casiraghi, who's come as close as anybody to opening the score. Now, here's a chance for Muller. Good save by the goalkeeper, and he denies Viali as well. A double save by Marco Gianni, who last week lost the number one spot in the Italian national team to Pagliuca. But this was two excellent saves. The second, he relied on his reflexes to keep out the shot from Viali. <laughs> Tremendous vocal encouragement now for both teams. And Viali's on his way again. Fusi back defending now. Is that a penalty? Fusi says that Viali took a theatrical dive. And this time, Fusi gets away with it. Well, there's nobody better in the business at winning penalties than Gianluca Vialli. He almost was flying his own. Anoni missed out. And Anoni has been penalised there for that push. So, problems here for Torino. Vialli standing over the ball. Is this where Juventus take the lead Mula oh that's a terrific save by Marco Gianni that was an evil free kick and the goalkeeper had to throw himself to his right to deny Juventus what would have been a 1-0 advantage 
Viale struggling for possession with Bruno, that's a splendid cross. And Anone happy to thrash the ball behind for a corner. Now Torino have advertised their vulnerability right at the start of the second half. And Viale is such a difficult customer in those positions. That incident has had the effect of increasing the noise around this stadium, a free header! And that's so close to the opening goal of the game. Kaziragi within a couple of feet of giving his side the lead. Here's Bruno. Oh, Schifo. To Sergio. First time that Torino have managed to string some passes together in this second half. Musi. Schifo, first touch let him down. Musi, Casa Grande, Sordo, 1 0. Wild celebrations at the Stadio dell'Alpe because Gianluca Sordo has given his side the lead. Torino able to exert a lot of pressure here on Juventus and it eventually paid off with this low, accurate shot from Sordo. Viali. Cola. Well, have to do better than that to beat Marco Jami. Viali. Oh, he's free this time. That's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. Juventus are level through their most experienced striker, Gianluca Vialli. Stole the march on the Torino defence. And look how he held the ball up as the goalkeeper committed himself. 15 minutes left. Plenty of red shirts forward here for Torino. If they could just string a couple of passes together. Pochi. Oh, that's close to 2 1. The substitutes almost gave his side the lead. Although there was a mistake here as Conte allowed the ball to drift behind him. Di Canio. Viali, that's a corner. Tremendous roar down at the Juventus end of the ground as the captain of Juventus wins the corner. Nicanio, the tricky Juventus winger, will take the corner kick. Venturino, goal! Deep in entry time at the end of the game. Muller with a shot. Venturin slid it past his own goalkeeper. It's the knockout punch for Juventus. That's for certain. Venturin. Viali. It's been quite a game. They just can't keep this man quiet. Referee choosing not to play the advantage. Free kick to Juventus, they'll be in no hurry to take it either. Indeed, it's all over. Juventus have won the Turin derby. Well, what a way to look forward to next week's showdown with Milan. The rest of the Serie A goals to come. First, James Richardson with the week's news. Good morning. Well, the good news this week is that despite Milan's dominance so far, the season isn't all over and done with as we had thought previously. The reason for this reprieve was step forward La Signora Juventus.
At one stage last Sunday, Juventus looked to go five points adrift of the champions, but thanks to their win over Torino and some extraordinary goalkeeping by Milan, keyed by what Inter fans are now calling the miracle of San Antonioli, the two teams will meet tomorrow with just two points between them. What this means, of course, is that a win from Juventus in tomorrow's big game will put them equal at the top of Serie A with the champions. And in uh, the Corridor della Sport this week, Viali announces Milan, it's our turn. Gazzetta della Sport, meanwhile, goes a step further. They announce Milan, you are surrounded. They named the three main challengers as being Trapattoni's Juventus, Inter Milan and Sampdoria. Now, while all the big fuss has been going on about tomorrow's match, uh, there's also been the continuing controversy over the battery chickens affair. Not as you might have thought, some sort of Profumo-esque scandal this one. Instead, it's the extraordinary revelations from Dr. Vera Slipodge, an Italian psychologist. After her research into Italian footballers, Slipodge announced that they are like farmyard animals, living in an infantile world of unconsciousness, free from self-criticism. They are bad fathers, she continued. And many children of players end up in therapy because they're so badly adjusted. Well, Sleepwatch has been the subject of a live TV debate on television this week in Italy. And also the Corriere della Sport has weighed in with this article announcing psychologist, you're offside, collecting here the angry responses of players like Mancini and Bruno and also coaches like Mondonico. The psychologist, meanwhile, stands by her opinion, saying that players in Italy are like battery chickens. Well, speaking of going cheap, comes the news that Gianmaro Borsano is selling Torino for the knockdown price of just £10 million. The new owner is set to be, no, not old McDonald, but in fact Enrico Preziosi, who with his company, Jocaria, sponsored Fiorentina last season. The price for this new involvement with Torino may be low, but along with the club, he'll have to shoulder £20 million worth of obligations and debts and the club's biggest current headache, Pasquale Bruno. The fighting cock of the battery chicken world, Bruno didn't have a very good game last Sunday. After spending all last week crying on about Gianluca Vialli's inability to score goals, Bruno was booked in the first minute of the game, let Vialli pass him to find the net in the second half and refused Mondonico's orders to mark Kaziragi instead. He can now expect a fairly hefty fine from his club Torino, but in the meantime, Tutor Sport on Wednesday had this rather entertaining story. Bruno comes straight away to Manchester. The idea here is that Peter Reid of Manchester City has contacted the player, who has family and friends in Stenny in Manchester, offering him an immediate transfer to the English club. Other trade rumours, and perhaps more reliable ones, concern Thomas Brolin, the bottom-nosed Swedish striker who scored against England this summer in the European Championships. Brolin is currently riding high with Palmer in Syria after a belated return from injury, but his days at the club may be numbered. Sampdoria's coach, fellow Swede Sven Goran Eriksson, is trying to lure him to the Genovese club. Nothing is definite yet, but Brolin's contract with Palmer does end next June, and so far he's delayed signing the renewal for well over a month. Well, the rest of the week's press coverage has been pretty much devoted to the big Juventus Milan showdown. And in fact, coming up later in today's programme, we've got an exclusive interview with Roberto Baggio about Juventus's chances in that game. But now, though, it's time to take a break, after which we'll have European Cup action, we'll have our competition, of course, and also the view from Planet Gascoigne. All of that after the break. So see you then. Welcome back. Our competition coming up, but first of all, a look back at the first of Sunday's Serie A goal action with Gary Blue. Fiorentina haven't won in Brescia for over 20 years, but Bayano squandered an opportunity to give the away side an early lead. The highlight of a tight first half arrived just before the break. It's another breathtaking strike from Romanian Georges Hagi and his third goal of the season. Fiorentina fought back immediately. Stefan Effenberg stinging the palms of Landucci here before Orlando ended this fine run with the equaliser just after the hour mark. Brescia's defenders allowed the former under-21 international far too much space. Still, his execution was faultless. 1-1 then the final score. Fiorentina slipped to sixth place. Cagliari in the dark strip played host to Palmer, who haven't tasted a home defeat since May. Buscedo trying the spectacular here. Palmer have found goals hard to come by this season. You can see why. Cagliari offered them a helping hand, though. Melli wormed his way through two defenders, but Yelpo did enough to divert the shot. 
Caleri's main source of inspiration remains Francescoli. Teferrell and the woodwork combined to keep him out. De Chiara, having recovered from the attentions of Scotland's Morris Malpass, then found the net, though on the wrong side. Caleri began to turn the screw in the second half. Capioli, the substitute, tricked his way past two defenders to set up a certain goal. Or well, so you would have thought. How did Fericano miss the chance? Francescoli then found his way past Minotti and Teferel. But not Georges Grun. Football can sometimes be so cruel. Seconds later, Thomas Brolin stole in at the far post to give Palmer an undeserved lead. It was Pizzi who crossed for the Swedes' first goal of the season. Cagliari pressed for an equaliser. The evergreen Mattioli set up this Capioli header. And in a last-ditched attempt to salvage a point, even Cagliari's goalkeeper Yelpo joined his teammates for a final flourish. It was all in vain. Palmer earned their first away points of the season. Beppe Signori led Lazio to his old stamping ground, Foggia. The home side dominated the early stages, Igor Kolivanov just slipping on the point of impact. Lazio, without flu victim Fiori in goal, had a good replacement at Orsi, who did well to deny De Vincenzo. Millions of pounds were invested to strengthen Lazio's defence, but their vulnerability is often exposed. For Vali here, with a needless push on Kolivanov. Penalty. Biagioni converted his third penalty in consecutive matches. 1-0 to Foggia. Not to be outdone, Lazio look for a penalty of their own. Lazio should have levelled the scores after half an hour. Riedler picks out Lusardi, whose shot lacked the power to beat Mancini. Vinter then combined with Riedler. Mancini was there again to thwart Lazio. From the resulting attack, Foggia increased their advantage. Petrescu holds off Sklosa for Brian Roy to score one of the easiest goals he's ever likely to score. The Dutchman was making his debut following his £2 million transfer from Ajax. The last chance of the first half also belonged to Foggia, though it was Lazio's Favali who sent another shiver down the spine of Dino Zoff, whose half-time chat brought Lazio out of their shell, Signori hitting the woodwork after only 25 seconds of the restart. Seven minutes later, Signori reminded Foggia's fans of what they're missing, his 11th goal of the season. The Italian international has already equaled the total he reached with Foggia last season. But where was Paul Gascoigne, you might ask? Well, here he is, at his brilliant best, but with just one too many defenders in his way. Signori then set up this chance for Vinter before Brian Roy raced clear in his search for Fodger's third. The match was as good as over by the time Di Biagio received a red card for this foul on Fuser. Kolivanov's long-range effort was academic. Fodger win 2-1, Lazio dropped to 10th in the table. At the San Siro, Inter aimed to halt Milan's unbeaten run in the 117th Milan derby in Serie A. After Bianchi went close for Inter, it was Van Basten who missed the best of the early chances. Now that's an unlikely sight. Inter were without Toto Scilacci and his replacement, Fontelan, was desperately unlucky not to have given his side the lead here. Milan opened the scoring six minutes before half-time. Lentini to Van Basten who tapped the ball back for the world's costliest player to unleash a truly unstoppable shot past Senga. It was a world-class finish from the world's most expensive footballer. Well, now to the game's major talking point. Tossotti, number two, lost out to Fontelan, but chased the striker back into the penalty area. Fontelan's run culminated in the fall, corner given, no penalty, but Fontelans was the last touch. It was a strange decision by the referee, who should have cautioned the interplayer for diving if there was no contact. Perhaps an apt reward arrived in the 75th minute. 
Bontalan again gets the better of Tosotti. And once again, the ball reaches to Agostini. The fullback has only one thing on his mind. One suspects the conclusion was the last thing on the goalkeeper's mind. To be fair to Antonioli, the ball did take a bizarre bounce after he dropped the ball. D'Agostini cheekily chanced his luck again. Antonioli on this occasion stood firm. 1-1 the final score. Milan stay unbeaten. More goals later. But now it's competition time here on Gazzetta Football Italia. Win a trip to Italy. The top Italian club shirt. Copies of our title music and Channel 4's new Italian football magazine. Just answer a simple question by ringing us on 0891 treble 3 treble 4. Our live game tomorrow comes from the Dele Alpi Stadium in Turin, home of Juventus, one of the glamour clubs of Italian football. Juventus have won the league title 22 times in their illustrious history, including four times in the 1980s. Their last title success came in 1986, when they were inspired by a French star. Was it A. Alain Gires, B. Jean-Pierre Papin, or C. Michel Platini? The first correct caller picked out by our computer when the lines close next Thursday goes into a winner's draw for a luxury trip to the Italian Cup final. They'll also take home an Italian shirt from one of the leading Serie A teams. Five runners-up, win copies of our Football Italian music now available on record, CD and cassette. And Channel 4's Italian soccer magazine, which includes full-colour lineups of every team, plus facts, figures and articles to complement our weekend coverage. Now last week, we asked you how many foreigners can a team play in any one Serie A game? The answer, of course, three. The lucky winner who takes home an Italian club shirt and goes into our end-of-season playoff is Mr. Grice from Selby in North Yorkshire. And these five runners-up all receive copies of our Football Italian music and our terrific new football magazine. For further details of the competition, they're on page 465 of Fortel, Channel 4's Teletext service. Although without injured stars David Platt and Roberto Baggio, Juventus got off to a great start in Czechoslovakia when Andreas Müller chipped home a superb long shot after only 23 minutes. The Czech's offside trap failed, but it seemed as if their goalkeeper's neat header had got them out of trouble in the second half. But they hadn't accounted for Dino Baggio's great vision. His superb volley from all of 40 yards simply stunned the home fans. Although Jan Morossi scored direct from a corner in the final minute, the Czechs face a difficult return in Turin. Roma completed a hat-trick of Italian victories, but their win over Galatasaray was a more frenetic and turbulent affair. The Turks had midfielder Uger sent off in the 39th minute for an off-the-ball incident involving Carboni. But they held out until the second half, when Brazilian defender Aldair, preferred to Canidia as the third foreigner, scored. It came after concerted pressure, their 15th corner, when Hiratin failed to clear. Aldair's volley was clinical. Rovers Carboni got his marching orders 15 minutes from time for his second bookable offence. But it didn't stop substitute Roberto Muzzi grabbing a second for the Italians after Salsano's excellent run. The Turkish international Hakan pulled one back for the visitors. A terrible error by the goalkeeper Zinetti gifting it. But in injury time Aldair scored his second, a 25-yarder crushing in off the post to give Roma a 3-1 lead to take into the second leg. So, a good week for Italian clubs. But how's it been for Paul Gaston? Well, my week, as you all know, started very well. A great win for England. Then I come and uh, we travel to Foggia. Um, nowadays, for teams like Foggia and Indonesia are not going to be any easy turnover. Um, Foggia played very, very well. I was quite impressed with them. I thought our performance as a team wasn't very good. 
Um, you know, I think we, when we go to games like this, we have to pull our sleeves up and buckle in, you know, because there's games where you can't, you can't play nice football all the time. And uh, it was another defeat for us, and that's two defeats in a row. I think we're playing as bad as Roma at the moment. Um, there's a derby, I think, yeah, and Rome is one of the biggest in the world, if not is the biggest. Um, Roma versus Lazio. You know, they never stop talking about it all day, all night, you know, wherever they go. So I'm finding it hard to go out, so I'm just sitting in the house for a week. Um, there's going to be about 90,000 people there. Um, and the, the atmosphere before the game is, uh, is incredible. Pigeons, little white pigeons fly over the place and uh, they hand out um, flags to everyone. And I'm really looking forward to it. And every week I've been talking about scoring goals here and there. And uh, I just seem to be scoring in England now. Um, I hope, and I only, only hope that uh, I score a goal against uh, Roma Sunday. Got a goal uh, against Seville, nice dribble, and on Sunday I had a similar sort of situation. Um, got past a couple of players and the keeper come out, but I just didn't have enough energy to go that little step further to try and put the ball in the back of the net. Or did I see the two guys and my friends at the said, but um, you know, it's uh, what I'm pleased with is that I can now, when I beat a player, get away from him that extra couple of yards, and I hope I can keep it like that for a long time. Well, return to training on Tuesday um, with Lazio. It was incredible seeing some of the supporters um, shouting abuse to, to as you say, Lazio. Um, I'm surprised to see Zoff get some stick off the fans. You know, they were asking for his head and wanting him sacked and that, which I feel very sorry for because there's only been 10 games and we've only been defeated three times. Two of them have been away from home. Um, I only hope that, you know, they, they keep off his back and give him time and uh, hopefully get things right. But as I say, things in Italy are very different and it's become a shock to me. I've been going out and people have been stopping the cars, shouting, beeping the horns. Uh, it's incredible, going to restaurants, you know, and all they want to talk about is a derby. Um, so hopefully we can win because for me, and I'm not just saying this, this Sunday is like life or death. And hopefully after Sunday, I'm still alive. Ciao and arriva dirty. This is... Uh the match of the year, at least in Rome. Well, I mean, not only Rome, uh, also in uh, Milan, Turin, and, and uh, in all the places where there are two teams. But uh, in Rome is somehow particular because, uh, in effect, the rivalry between uh, Lazio and Rome supporters is something which goes uh, beyond an imagination. In this match, uh, there, are on, there will not only be the two points uh, uh, to add uh, to the table, uh, but uh, it is also um, an occasion, an opportunity for, uh, for both teams uh, to give uh, a new sense to the season. Even if uh, one of the opponents is first of the league and the other one is the last, uh, still uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot say that uh, the one first in the league is going to win. Uh, because the derby is different. Sunday will just be the 11th match of the year. Certainly, a winning uh, will give a new, will give a more enthusiasm uh, and uh, would ease out the the proceeding of the season. But uh, in effect, uh, if we do not win on Sunday, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, that uh, our season is going to be is going to be a failure. The club position has been has been made very clear by the president Cagnotti and by the general manager. Uh, Bendoni and all the other uh, Lazio officials. Even if in the in the event that uh, we do not win or that even we do not draw, uh, nothing is going to change. Welcome back. Our Juventus Milan preview coming up. But first, the rest of the goals from Sunday's Serie A. Pescara's hopes for survival were given an almighty boost when their new signing Carlos Dunga produced this powerful volley in the 75th minute against Atalanta. The Brazilian was making his home debut. Eight minutes later, and Paladini made it 2 0 with another sweetly struck shot. 
Dunga's first-time effort was blocked, but the under-21 international followed up in style. It finished 2-0, it's Pescara's first victory since the opening day of the season. Troubled Roma in red were unfortunate not to have opened the scoring against Ancona in the first minute. It was to prove to be a frustrating afternoon for Boscov's side. The coach was one defeat away from losing his job. Piacentini denied here. Ancona were always going to be a threat at the other end, especially with Dittari pulling the strings, pulling out a good save too from the goalkeeper. Ancona's recent acquisition from Slovan Bratislava, Glonek, began a move which led to Ancona's 10th-minute goal. Roma's charitable defence handed Ancona this opportunity for Lupo. The referee was alert in playing the advantage after Agostini was sent tumbling. 1-0 to Ancona. Rizzi Terry's shot was then somehow kept out by Michilo's knee. The 21-year-old goalkeeper was then called upon to clear this drive from Mihailovic. Agostini's attempt at goal was only a brief respite as a siege on Ancana's goal became more intense. Rizzi Telly again denied there. Early in the second half, the frame of the goal came to Ancona's rescue for the second time. Boscov may have already started to pack his bags after this amazing save by Michillo from Benedetti, who almost gave away a penalty moments later. Luck was on Roma's side then. The inspired Ancona goalkeeper continued to keep the anxious Roma players at bay. And even if he didn't, the woodwork seemed to have taken a considerable dislike to the men in red. Boscov brought on Carnavali for the last 20 minutes, who was doing his best to bring Roma level. But it took a defender, starting only his 13th game in two seasons, to bring delight and relief to the home fans. It proved to be lucky 13 for the sweeper, Comey. Michilo, who had a splendid game, showed his one sign of youthful exuberance. Maybe he should have caught the cross. It would have been a harsh decision to award Roma a penalty here for this shove on Rizzi Telly. But Ancona couldn't prevent Roma's juggernaut momentum, although the home side left it till two minutes into injury time to steal the winner. Carnavali on hand to net from close range. The goalkeeper's inexperience is to the fore again. After making an excellent stop, he taps the ball into Carnavali's path. Final score, 2-1, Boscov can breathe a sigh of relief. This was Napoli's first game under new coach Ottavio Bianchi. He might have hoped for easier opponents than Sampdoria, who almost took the lead early on through Chiesa. When things aren't going your way in football, you soon know about it. The width of the upright denies Careca from an opening goal. Not too many weeks ago, Fonseca couldn't stop scoring goals. Now Serie A's goalkeepers are taking their revenge. They've been working on this one down at Sampdoria's training ground for several weeks now. I don't think Mancini's miss was part of the sequence. This has to be one of the outstanding goalkeeping saves of the season. Galli's reflexes denying Chiesa. The right wing was a familiar path to goal for Sampdoria, who are still missing the high-class finishing of Gianluca Viali. The opening goal after 41 minutes came from a similar move. Mancini's shot at goal is deflected past his own goalkeeper by Zigliani, making his Napoli debut. When Zigliani signed from Brescia, the last thing he wanted was to be helping the opposition from day one. Second half now, and Jugovic was prepared to exploit the inside right channel, denied here by Galli. But shortly afterwards, Jugovic wasn't to be denied. The former Red Star player with a Red Star finish to make it 2 0. The delicious back heel of Mancini was a real feature of this goal. This was Jugovic's fifth of the season. Now this was the incident which angered Napoli. Turn drives the ball in and number two Ferrara turns the ball over the line. Now the goal isn't given, ruled out for offside, 
but it's the referee who makes the decision, not the linesman, who failed to raise his flag. On the slow motion replay, it's interesting to note the position of the linesman as number eight, Jugovic, plays the ball out of defence. He's still running away from play. The referee's in a worse position than his colleague, and yet he makes the eccentric decision. Twelve minutes left and Sampdoria score their third. It's a result of a move spanning three quarters of the length of the field. Lombardo is impeded by Zilliani, who's having the sort of debut he'll forget to tell his grandchildren about. Lombardo's direct style means he's always likely to create an opening. Mancini's confident spot kick makes it 3-0 to Sampdoria. Lombardo's header then skimmed the top of the crossbar. If only Napoli could have found a goal an hour earlier, all might have been so different. Fonseca's shot deflects off Manini after 89 minutes to make the score 3-1. Now, can you spot which Sampdoria defender misdirects a header into Fonseca's path? Answers on a postcard, please, to the Des Walker fan club. Sampdoria win by three goals to one. Their unbeaten run at home now stretches back 12 months. The match between Udinese and Genoa in the red and blue turned into an ill-tempered game marred by two sendings off. Genoa had the best of the early part of the match. This is Dobrovolski wastefully shooting over. Our cameras failed to catch why Torrente was sent off for his part in this incident. The referee was more eagle-eyed, reaching for his red card, Torrente gave a fair impression of a father whose children had been taken into local authority care. With just ten men, Genoa didn't abandon their attacking principles and perhaps were unlucky when Arco, making his debut, failed to win a penalty. But from then on in, it was all Udinese, who had a goal ruled out here for offside. The replay shows it was a marginal decision when Branca heads the ball in. But the opening goal wasn't long in arriving. Matei had options to his left and right, but straight ahead was his chosen path. Most players would have given a simple pass to the right, but not Matei. The sliding Balbo causes more confusion in the penalty area. Balbo scored his goal shortly afterwards. Number five, Caricola, should have cleared the ball here, but Balbo wasn't complaining. Nine now for the season for him. The aerial threat of Udinese always caused problems. Coming up, the second sending off of the game for Caricola for disturbing the perm of Marinaro. Genoa down to nine men. Final score, Udinese 11, Genoa 9, that's players left on the field. Final score, 3-0 to Udinese. Milan now lead by two points, but Juventus have pushed themselves into second spot, nicely setting up tomorrow's clash. Torino dropped a third with Inter, Sampdoria and Fiorentina all well in the title hunt. Although Pescara scored their second win last week, they're still rooted to the foot of the table. Marco Van Basten and Giuseppe Signori still lead the goal-scoring charge, but Abel Balbo moves up to challenge after getting two more for Udinese last weekend. Now on to Serie B, and first action from Sunday's clash of the leaders, Cremonese, against Venezia. Cremonese took the lead after 12 minutes. Gustavo De Sotti, their Argentinian striker, was brought down, and he seemed to have wasted the penalty, but he made amends by following home the rebound. A revived Venezia drew level early in the second half. Maialaro headed home after 47 minutes. Venezia then took the lead after a mistake from the Cremonese goalkeeper, Turchi. 
Romaldi swooped to convert the rebound. Cremonese fought back to draw level after 64 minutes with this header from Andrea Tenton. Serie B's leading scorer now has eight for the season. The final score, 2 all. Cremonese now without a win in three games. So that gave Reggiano the opportunity to move level on points at the top after their 3-0 win over Spa. They're the only team still unbeaten in Serie B. Remember, four go up. The only unbeaten side in Serie A are, of course, are AC Milan. Their last big test before Christmas comes tomorrow when they visit Juventus. It's our live game on Channel 4. Last season, both games were drawn one each. And James Richardson has been to visit a man who sadly won't be on the field tomorrow to get his views on the battle for Serie A supremacy. So the big game is finally almost upon us. Tomorrow afternoon, Juventus will take on the Serie A champions AC Milan at the Stadio degli Alpi in Turin. Meanwhile, I'm on completely the wrong side of Italy, going sports shopping in a place called Tieni, about 50 miles to the west of Venice. Luckily, though, I have a very good reason for being here. We're about to talk to the man who tomorrow will be one of the game's most interested and expert spectators, the captain of Juventus, Roberto Baggio. We went to meet Roberto at his new shop, Roberto Baggio Sports, just outside of Tieni in the area where he grew up. And hey presto, there he was, freshly changed into some appropriately subdued leisure wear and still suffering the odd twinge from the broken rib he received after some rough treatment in that Scotland-Italy game. Roberto is less contented, of course, about his broken rib. Apart from just the physical pain, it won't be easy for him tomorrow, sitting in the stands and watching his teammates go out to play the most important game of the season so far without him. It's a brutal position, yes, because it's clear that I would like to be in the field too, even because it's a game in which we can play something very important for the Scudetto, because to be able to win tomorrow, it's clear that it would put us in a position to go uh, a pari del Milan, anche se non una partita in meno. So with Captain Baggio spectating tomorrow, I asked him for his opinion on who will be Juventus' key men in his absence. Di sicuro è, può essere Viali, visto che è un momento di, di grande forma, può essere determinante insieme a, a Müller, a centrocampo e, e Carrera per Ruzzi dietro. Penso che loro possano essere i punti importanti per, per poter vincere domenica. Both of last season's Serie A games with Milan ended in one-all draws and Juventus' scorer both times is the man who will tomorrow be filling in for Baggio alongside Viali, Gigi Casiraghi. Gigi adesso sia in un momento che magari non ha giocato tantissimo però può essere decisivo anche lui domenica perché di sicuro tutti cercheranno magari di fermare Viali e può essere una cosa importante per lui così essere magari un po' più libero. Roberto Baggio had hit some extraordinary form just before his injury, scoring six goals in his last two games. Last Sunday, though, with him injured and plat out for a knee operation, a slim down Juventus had their best result of the season so far, knocking off formidable Torino. Less charitable observers this week have suggested that the absences have helped coach Giovanni Trapattoni to field a more balanced and cohesive team, but only the very brave would argue that Juventus will be better off without Baggio tomorrow, especially when they have to face his arch-rival, Milan's Marco Van Basten. Lui è sicuramente il, il centravanti più completo che esista al mondo. Mm, continua a fare grappoli di goglia, li ha fatti anche, anche in Coppa Campione adesso, per cui... Ha una grandissima squadra, però lui è grandissimo già per conto suo, per cui deve solo continuare a fare quello che ha fatto finora. Io credo che un grandissimo punto di forza del Milan sia Raikard. Io credo che magari non sia considerato per quello che, che vale effettivamente, che personalmente credo che Raikard sia un giocatore insostituibile in questa squadra. Beh, di sicuro Gullet ha fatto... Uh, delle cose eh, importantissime, ha lasciato dei ricordi incredibili. Lui si conosce di più e ha ancora più, più fama di, magari di, di Raikard, però per conto mio Raikard è stato forse sottovalutato per quello che ha dato. 
Since Roberto will be enjoying the view from the stands tomorrow, we asked him to join the ranks of Italy's amateur football coaches, there are 56 million of them at the last count, and give us his game plan on how to stop Milan. La prima cosa che farei per fermare il Milan sarebbe di giocare in pressing, in pratica tutto, tutto il campo, perché loro sono abituati a farlo, però forse sono meno abituati a, a, a dover giocare contro squadre che fanno pressing. Io così preparerei la mia squadra proprio a, a stargli addosso dall'inizio alla fine. È chiaro che dovresti impostare la squadra su un gioco corto, squadra molto corta e come ho detto prima riuscire a fare il pressing, cioè non li fare ragionare perché loro se hanno la possibilità di ragionare già sono bravi tecnicamente, tatticamente si sanno muovere molto bene senza palla per cui metterebbero in difficoltà chiunque. Well, funnily enough, Badger almost ended up at Milan himself when he was still the yet bright young star of Fiorentina. Before his record-breaking transfer to Juventus in 1990, Roberto had reached a personal agreement with the Milan management for a move to the club. Sì, avevano parlato, c'erano stati dei, dei contatti, però io ero già stato venduto da un anno alla Juve, per cui il Milan, non, quando ha saputo questo, si è tirato via subito dalla trattativa. Ogni tanto ci pensi perché è normale, però io adesso vivo una, una realtà diversa e, e sto bene con questa. One thing a place at Milan would almost certainly have meant, though, is the odd title or two, something Roberto's career is conspicuously without. As his critics are quick to point out, much as he may play like a champion, Baggio is a footballer who still never won a cup final or a championship. Sì, infatti, eh, è quello che, che purtroppo eh, manca, è, è qualcosa di, di, di importante, è una vittoria, però credo che a 25 anni c'è ancora tanto tempo per poterlo fare. Juventus spent over £30 million this summer in the hope of bringing the Serie A title home this season. So far, though, they've been overshadowed again by Milan's dominance. Tomorrow comes a head-on clash that Juventus really can't afford to fail if they're serious about the championship. I think yes, because tomorrow the game is important. There is a great effect of the championship, so I consider all the players of the game to look at it. Is it decisive? Ma decisivo no, ma importantissimo di sicuro, soprattutto per la Juve. Ok. Uh, well, a successful day. I spoke to Roberto Baggio and I found that matching Juventus scarf and shell suit I've always wanted. All set then for tomorrow. Milan with that chance to knock off yet another competitor. Juventus with that chance to regain their traditional place at the top of Serie A. Remember, it's live tomorrow on Channel 4. Theme music to Gazzetta Football Italia is out now and if I was you I would go and get it. It is called I'm Stronger Now by Definitive 2. It's very good. Go and get it. Don't miss it. Ciao. I'm stronger now than I've ever been before It's in my soul and